We're sitting down with Michael Scheuer, the man who had served in the CIA for more than 20 years, up until 2004. At one time, he was the chief of the CIA bin Laden unit. Then he went and exposed how counter-effective Washington's methods were in the fight against terror. He looked at the U.S. through its enemy's eyes. In fact, it's the title of one of his books called uh, Through Our Enemy's Eyes. I'm very pleased to have the chance to interview you, Thank Mr. You. Scheuer. I'm glad to be here. Bin Laden is gone. Who is Washington's number one enemy now? Washington's enemy is an enemy that doesn't exist. We're fighting an, uh, an Islamic enemy that uh, Washington believes is out to kill us because we have elections, because we're free, because we have women in the workplace. It's an enemy that doesn't exist. It didn't exist when bin Laden was alive. It doesn't exist now. America is being attacked because of its foreign policy in the, in the Muslim world, because of its support for Israel, because of its support for the Saudi police state, because of its presence on the Arab Peninsula. And until we accept that, until Americans can say to each other, whether you support aid to Israel or not, our relationship with Israel is causing this war, we are not going to be able to, to, to defeat this enemy. And Israel itself, as a country, is not the problem. The real problem are, is the leaders of the Jewish American community in the United States who influence and corrupt our Congress to support Israel when we have no interest there. You imply that it, it, the Israeli lobby is dragging the United States into the wars, into absolutely. the conflict? They're absolutely dragging us in. Iraq was a war that was pr pr proffered or was called for mainly... Then let me ask you this. Yeah. The situation in the region, in the wake of all these revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa, yes. you can pretty much describe it as turmoil. Turmoil is no good for Israel. What you're saying? Well, the, the, the American political establishment is caught between two things. They're extremely pro-Israel, and they're almost Marxist in their belief that democracy and the spread of democracy is inevitable in all places, in all peoples, at all times. And so they need to protect the Israelis, but they can't say what is a reality. For example, there is not going to be a democracy in Tunisia. Or, 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 or Libya or Egypt that in any way resembles democracy in the West. And yet they, what they've done is create anarchy. They've created a situation where the only beneficiaries are the Islamists. The guns that have flown out of Egypt, out of Tunisia, out of Libya to the Islamists have been enormous in their volume. And the prisons that were opened in Egypt, Tunisia and Libya have reinforced the Islamist groups across the world. So their, their mindless, their mindless uh, pursuit of secular democracy at the end of the day endangers the stability of the region and probably the whole world. Are you saying we're going to see further radicalization of the region? Oh, especially in Africa. Yes, ma'am. The guns that are flowing out of the three places where there were Arab Spring revolts are going to cause problems in Somalia, across North Africa, and in Nigeria. Let's talk about Syria. Yes. Syria says the earth will start shaking if anyone intervenes in their internal affairs. How badly does the U.S. Uh, is the U.S. trying to interfere? Oh, I think we're, we're interfering uh, unconscionably. Uh, until they removed the U.S. ambassador, he was running around the country trying to encourage groups to overthrow the Syrian government. That is not the role of any diplomat, United States or Russian or Chinese or British. Uh, we have uh, really very cold-bloodedly urged Syrians to get out on the street knowing that they're going to get shot down by their government. Uh, again, Syria is a country where there is no U.S. interest. Since I was a little boy, we've been afraid of the Syrians. And if you look at the map, it's hard to imagine that little blot of country called Syria could be a threat to the United States. The CIA has reportedly worked with the Syrian opposition for years. Well, I'm not sure we worked with the Syrian opposition. We've certainly worked with the Wiki Syrian Lix government. Cables, uh, well, I haven't. Yeah. Well, then, if that's if if it's there, it's there. Uh, but our our relationship with the Syrians is really a relatively unimportant one. But again, it's another very good example of the dichotomy in the thinking of American leaders, because as we call for democracy in Syria. If Assad goes, Israel's security goes straight down. If the region becomes a complete mess, doesn't Washington see any dangers to Israel? I mean, with Iran involved, it, it won't be pretty. I think that's exactly right, ma'am. Uh, I don't know what the thinking is, except that they have come down in, on the belief that democracy is better for everybody. And the truth is, American and Western foreign policy 
interests in the Middle East have depended for 50 years on the maintenance of tyranny. Tyranny that pr gave us access to oil, tyranny that protected Israel, and on, in the last 20 years, tyrannies that persecuted Islamists to protect us. All of that is going by the wayside. And to the Israelis' credit, the Israelis are the only ones who have stood up and said, democracy may not be very good for our security, and they couldn't be more correct. About Iran, what's Washington's plan for Iran? Whatever Israel's plan is for Iran, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, are death that the Israelis will attack them off their own hook. And if Israel attacks Iran, the Americans will get blamed for condoning it, whether we did or not. So I think what we're seeing is a slow, uh, almost inexorable advance toward uh, some kind of a conflict with, with Iran. What do you make of these recent accusations that the Iranian government was trying to uh, kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington? Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to know whether or not the, the information was accurate. But when I was a young intelligence officer, I worked against Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah. And I can tell you, in the 90s, they were meticulous in covering their tracks and only using as agents of terrorism their own people. The plot that was described by the Attorney General of the United States is, is a comic opera. Um, it Through is, a Mexican drug cartel. The, yeah. yeah, and, and to, for, to believe that the Iranians would risk war with the United States, Israel, and much of NATO to kill a Saudi ambassador who was not even part of the royal family, that's hard for me to believe. Let's talk about Libya. Libya is in ruins in the wake of NATO bombings. Yes. It's brimming with weapons. Yes. An Al-Qaeda flag was planted over a courthouse in Benghazi. Yes. How good of a playground is Libya for people with radical agendas? Very strong Islamist presence in Libya. Um, they, uh, since the, the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan, uh, Libya has sent as many of its people to fight in those insurgencies, the Islamist insurgencies, as any other country in North Africa, maybe outside of Saudi Arabia. The Libyan Islamic Fighting Group uh, fought a long time against the Soviets. Uh, they fought against Gaddafi. A great number of Libyans went to Iraq and to Afghanistan to fight us. And whatever strength the Libyan resistance had in terms of military capability, that came from experienced Islamist fighters. So the idea that um, somehow there's democracy afoot in Libya uh, is, is just simply wrong. Could it become a hotbed of terror? I don't know if it could become a hotbed of terror, but it can become a country that's decidedly anti-American, anti-NATO. Um, it can be probably less a hotbed of, of terror than a country that is vastly unstable. It seems the U.S. is almost uh, creating grounds for terrorists to surge and then goes out fighting them. We see it in Pakistan. They got the whole nation alienated because of the strikes. A lot of people want revenge. Uh, how efficient is that? We are very efficient in this day and age, in the last 20 years, in creating enemies. We're not very efficient in creating security for the United States. We have the best educated population in the world, and we have the people with the few, littlest amount of common sense. Uh, how many times have we heard Mr. Clinton, Mr. Bush, Mr. Obama say, th this has nothing to do with religion, this is not a religious war, this is a bunch of people who are just madmen. We are definitely fighting a religious war. And until we come to realize that, we are never going to be able to defeat it. In fact, we're, we're encouraging the growth of a, next, of a new generation of people who are going to fight us. The U.S. is pulling its troops out of Iraq, but at the same time, it's boosting its military presence in the Persian Gulf. More ground troops are planned to be deployed. New drone bases are being built. What do you make of such expansion? The ignor it just demonstrates again the ignorance of the United States government in terms of its political leadership about what, what, what our problem is in the Muslim world. The, the key point of formation for Al-Qaeda was the presence of U.S. military forces on the Arabian Peninsula. Fifteen years after they declared war on us, we're now going to take people out of Iraq and put them in Kuwait and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, reinforcing our presence on the Arab Peninsula only going to cause us more foes and more enemies in the Islamic world. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, contradiction. It's, an, it's okay, a lack let, let of common sense. Let me ask you this. If uh, the U.S. pulls out out of everywhere, yes. 
Is it going to be the end of terrorism? It certainly would, would deny the terrorists the, the glue of unity that keeps them focused on the United States. If we weren't the main enemy, they would be attacking Israel, they would be attacking the Saudis, they would be attack, attacking the Moroccans. The war would be... Being, and would you say let them attack let them go. The, the Israelis and the Saudis? Let them go. Sometimes they say the Chinese will come in. I said let the Chinese deal with these people for the next 50 years. We've had enough of it. But I think the point is the Americans can't get out. We're dependent on the Saudis to maintain our interests in the world oil market and the Saudis buy, next to the Chinese, more of our debt than anyone else. So as long as we're side by side with the, with the Saudis and with the Israelis, we're stuck in the Middle East and America will continue to bleed. Dr. Schroyer, thanks for the interview. Yes, ma'am.